Hello and welcome to the last class of Martha Nussbaum Feeling Fragility Flourishing, which has been a 12 week course and uh, that I've been running at the Mary Ward Center. Um, of course, the course or teaching um, has been interrupted, uh, disrupted because of the coronavirus outbreak. And as a result, classes have been taking place remotely like this. Um, this is going to be the last one of Nussbaum. And let's see if in this session we can not only um, explore and debate and perhaps disagree um, about some of the interesting themes that appear in her most recent work, you know, as speaking at this point in time, uh, the cosmopolitan tradition. But I also want to use this talk um, to get us to think about some of the lasting contributions of Martha Nussbaum to thinking more broadly. And let's see if we can bring together some threads from this course and we can draw out some overall characteristics of Martha Nussbaum's philosophy. And yeah, hopefully this will give us um, a way to appraise this very singular and fascinating thinker that we have had the pleasure of reading and debating over the last few weeks. Okay, right. Um, perhaps characteristically of me, we are not going to begin with Martha Nussbaum, I'm afraid. We're going to begin with something a little bit different. Um, and I wanted us to have a look and have a think about this image here. Um, you might know what it is. The Tower of Babel um, by Peter Bruegel. Now let's take a closer look. So this is a painting from 1563. Now the Tower of Babel is a very interesting one. It appears in the book of Genesis. And the tower, I suppose it represents something that I want to draw out here, which is the, the promise and the... Um, the failures of cosmopolitanism. Of course, we need to define what cosmopolitanism is. I'll do that in a second. Let's just stay with the tower. So in the book of Genesis, um, the tower is built, um, well, it seems to have been built um, by King Nimrod. Now Nimrod is, uh, I think he's one of the descendants. He's the great grandson, I think, of Noah, Noah and Yark. And the human race survives that um, ordeal and kind of speaks at the end with one voice, one language, and settles in one area, Babel, Mesopotamia. And so they build this huge tower, the Tower of Babel. And I'll quote from Genesis here. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the very heavens. And let us make, make a name for ourselves, otherwise we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now, as some of you will know with the Tower of Babel, God is not impressed whatsoever. Um, and he is kind of concerned that this is an affront to his own power. That's something like Nimrod on the bottom left with his retinue of folk um, threatens to usurp God's power. And so as a result, um, what well, the tower is destroyed, um, the, the speech of these people is, is so um, confused that they are no longer able to understand each other. And so from the human race speaking with one language, we get to a point where there are now multiple languages, multiple nations and multiple confusion. So what does that mean for us? Well, we still haven't defined what cosmopolitanism is, so let's do that. Let's look at a, a more recent formulation from a brilliant thinker called Kwame Anthony Appiah. Um, this is a book that came out fairly recently, Cosmopolitanism, Ethics in a World of Strangers. And Appiah is basically um, kind of reviving what is an ancient tradition. And if, you'll have, if you've had time to read the Nussbaum of this week, you'll know that this tradition um, is said to go back to ancient Greece. Now, Appiah Ap sets out what cosmopolitanism is quite nicely, quite clearly. Um, I'll give you a quote. And the one thought that cosmopolitans share is that no local loyalty can ever justify forgetting that each human being has responsibilities to every other. So this is interesting. And one of, this is one of, the, one of the debates that we're going to be exploring is that um, to claim to um, be a citizen of the world, cosmopolites, the Greek word, a citizen of the cosmos, a citizen of the universe, is to say, perhaps, and this is where the debate lies, that the human race, very broadly speaking, you are as loyal to your fellow human 
as you are to your fellow citizen, you know, say from the, the city, the town in which you're from. Now there's a debate in Greek um, for, and then it appears among Roman Stoics about this question of loyalty. To be a citizen of the world, does that mean that you look down on, you renounce your local ties? Or are the two mutually compatible? Now, Appiah's kind of cosmopolitanism is, um, it's kind of mild in its, in, its, in its useful in many respects. He says, I'm urging that we should learn about people in other places. Okay, well, you know, what can you disagree on with that? We should, I continue, well, he continues, take an interest in their civilizations, their arguments, their errors, their achievements. Not because that will bring us to agreement, but because it will help us get used to one another. I really like that formulation. Appiah isn't here, or in case we're concerned that a, a kind of universal identity could be something that is secretly ethnocentric, secretly Eurocentric. It could be about pointing across Western liberal values. Appiah's saying, no, let's take a step back. We should be interested in learning about others. We should be curious. We should wonder at their customs and we should respect them. Not because we're going to make them like us or we're going to become like them, but we're just going to understand them. Now, this formulation, it reminds me of something that we get in Spinoza, Spinoza and his political treatise, where he kind of calls upon us um, not to condemn human actions, not to mourn them, not to mock them, but to understand them. So cosmopolitanism for Appiah is about understanding others. Understanding others through understanding their ways of life. Maybe at this stage you're thinking, hold on a minute. Yes, there is that element, but there still is something quite bold about saying, hold on a minute. I am a citizen of the universe. And of course, in British politics, this has had a curious recent, not very recent, but fairly recent resonance. So let's think about someone who was our prime minister until last year and that's Theresa May and you might be know no you might know where I'm going to go with this Theresa May made a speech where she said a citizen of the world is a citizen of nowhere so what Theresa May was doing and we get this actually among other right-wing speakers um is mocking and challenging the language of cosmopolitanism by saying that actually the cosmopolitan isn't loyal they're not attached they don't value home customs. They don't care. Nor should we assume that cosmopolitanism speaks for everybody. Many people may, may find nothing, may be left cold and unmoved by this vague, you know, philosophical universalism. What does it mean for them? So this, there's been an interesting debate around this in British political thought. Um, David Goodhart, a man who claims to have been on the left and seen the light. I'm not really being fair there. Um, but someone who was more on the left and then says, well, hold on a minute. Um, one problem for, for liberals, London, metropolitan, liberal elite, is that they don't understand how most people think. They don't understand that most people probably don't share the liberalism um, that they have and in fact there's something very arrogant about trying to impose that liberalism on everybody else so he does this in this book called the road to somewhere it's a really interesting read i i recommend it i don't obviously i don't agree with um, all his politics but i think this is a fantastic analysis and it's one that will get you thinking um this is what he looks like and so he presents this hypothesis where he separates um britain i mean it is simplistic but the arguments are interesting um between two different tribes You've got the anywheres, these are the, the rootless cosmopolitans, the citizens of the world, which he associates with London, with the middle classes, um, with, you know, diverse food tastes and what have you. They're probably going to be Lib Dem or Labour, um, left wing. And then he contrasts that with the somewheres. The somewheres are conservative. The somewheres are interested in the family and the nation. The somewheres are from small towns or the countryside. The somewheres don't want to eat um, a different form of global cuisine every day. Um, now, let me just give you some of the characteristics of this. Um, and I'll do this through two kind of foods. You know, you'll, you'll probably see where I'm going to go with this. <clears throat> so what is an anywhere? Okay, well, avocado. 
the, the smashed avocados on toast of the millennial, of the hipster East Londoner. What is an anywhere? Well, Goodhart tells us. He says anywheres liberally inclined graduate so he also links in the university education in case you're wondering where i'm going with this we're we're looking at um the political consequences of cosmopolitanism and, and a backlash to it so the anywheres liberally inclined graduates now goodhart is trying to make an argument that these anywheres think that they're everybody but in fact they're only a small part of the british population he says they generally belong to the mobile minority who went to a residential university like a campus university and then into a professional job. They've left the place where they've grown up. They don't feel an affiliation with that. That's partly why they are attached anywhere. Now, Goodhart says that these anywheres have got a lot of political influence. They predominate among decision makers, opinion formers, journalists, politicians, the, the top end of the middle class. They're concentrated in London, enough of metropolitan centres, university towns. They like change. They don't care. They don't, they're not nostalgic about lost Britain. They're not even really nationalistic. In fact, they look down on nationalism. They value autonomy and self-realisation. Okay. So what's he trying to get to with this? Let's just see what he has to say about somewhere. It's represented here by the humble British cup of tea. Of course, you're thinking with tea. It's something that first came from China and then India and, then, and has a whole story of empire and capitalism wrapped up in it. But let's not go there he certainly doesn't um the british cup of tea a nice bit of clip art there well somewhere actually this is, this is an interesting point you're more likely to be somewhere if you're from a less uh, economically powerful um class the average somewhere is on a middling income they left school before doing a levels there's a you're probably thinking there's a brexit thing isn't there especially the link between um the likelihood of voting for brexit and your university level attainment. In those who, who are more likely to have degrees, who are more likely to want to vote remain. To be honest, what's wrapped up there is a generational thing because we know that in the last 20 years, a lot more young people, especially from working class backgrounds, are going to university. But still, this is about where you're going and where you're from. They tend to be older, middle and lower class, small towns. They don't welcome change. They want security and familiarity. And there's a nostalgia there. They regret the passing of a more structured and tradition-bound world. Okay, you might be thinking, yep, this tells us something quite interesting about Brexit. But it's not just about that. This isn't just about the past. This is about the um, about cosmopolitanism and its reaction as living ideas. So a couple, of, well, I'll tell you about one recent book. You might have picked it up. It came out a couple of years ago. Matthew Goodwin, well, he's written this with his former PhD supervisor, Roger Eatwell. Um, but Matthew Goodwin, you might have seen him on the radio, you might have heard him on the radio, seen him on YouTube. He writes about populism and again, you know, it's often quite scathing of liberal platitudes. He has this idea that liberal cosmopolitanism completely misunderstands and underestimates the importance of um, community and, and, and the, the collective belonging that nationhood gives. Now on the left, in the Labour Party at least, there was um, there has been a lot of thinking about this blue Labour, using uh, combining social democratic politics around the welfare state uh, alongside the advocacy and um, wishing to protect the family, the nation state, not pushing too much personal cultural liberalism through. So this is present, and this just gives us a snapshot into how being cosmopolitan or not plays out in british politics where do you stand well let's think about where martha nussbaum stands not on british politics she probably doesn't give a hoot and you know frankly good for her because there are times where it drives all of us mad but instead in this book the cosmopolitan tradition it's from late 2019 what nussbaum sets out to do i think um is <clears throat> give an outline of the philosophical roots of cosmopolitanism of a, of a tradition she does this through thinking through some stoic philosophers cicero marcus aurelius um 
and then I want to call them neo-Stoic, but that's wrong, really. But um, thinkers like um, very much influenced by the Stoics, like uh, Hugo Grotius and Adam Smith. Thinkers that um, debate what it means to make a declaration that your fellow human is your fellow citizen. But then linking that up with a kind of concern that she has, and we're going to get to this concern in a second, a concern that by um, saying you belong to everywhere, that you un, you disregard the, the importance and the, and the political value of the nation state. Further, and this seems like a separate argument to me, but she presents them as part of the same package, that cosmopolitanism um, is based on an idea of moral equality among human beings and human beings only, which she thinks she's worried about this. And we're going to come to this as well. We're going to criticise this, actually. Um, but it's worth noting with this book, um, and this might, you might have got the sense when you were looking through the reading that I sent you, um, <clears throat> that it's based on a series of lectures from the early 2000s um, that are then rewritten a bit. It doesn't set out systematically um, to tell us what the cosmopolitan tradition is. It kind of just goes through some instances. Um, it doesn't discuss one very important thinker in depth in the cosmopolitan tradition. I won't name him yet, but you might already know. But to in her defense, she says that she's not going to mention this guy um, because a lot had already written on him, but still, we might expect that. So what we, we have had in front of us over, over the week is a book which is going to make a cautious and slightly lukewarm argument for cosmopolitanism it's going to have some you know quite bold moments you know the final sentence is quite a passionate call for cosmopolitanism but Nussbaum is also going to raise a series of concerns so what we need to do what we need to think about is what this well what is the cosmopolitan tradition what is cosmopolitanism uh, how does she define or give some features of this tradition? And then are we satisfied with the account? Because perhaps we might not be. We'll also recall from our reading last week, The Monarchy of Fear, that this is a book that has come out um, about a year after the last one. And we know that with Nussbaum, she's a very much a public philosopher. She's very prolific. Um, and we might want to kind of think and weigh up here um, what that means, you know, for a philosopher to produce books every year, um, books on all manner of topics. Are there some limitations? Let's just leave that one there for now. Um, and let's start talking first of all about what the cosmopolitan tradition is, especially in the way that Nussbaum sets it out. So let's begin here with a man in a barrel, Diogenes. Diogenes of Sinope. Now we can see that Diogenes, naked, um, is addressing another man. This man, well, we can tell by his clothes and by the soldiers around him, is some kind of great man, a great leader. It's Alexander the Great. Now this this image is from a famous story um, in Diogenes Laertius who writes Lives of the Philosophers, and these are often quite amusing, but sometimes spurious tales of the actual lives and kind of quite gossipy of different philosophers, where Diogenes um, was sitting in his barrel where he lived, um, out in the public square, and Alexander the Great approached him and asked him, you know, I can give you one thing, what would you like? And then Diogenes says, to keep out of my life. He doesn't want his the sunlight to be blocked by Alexander. He wants to enjoy this simple natural pleasure. And a king, an emperor as great as Alexander, can offer him nothing, can offer him nothing else. Now it seemed as an amusing moment. How can Diogenes not want anything else? How can he not understand and perform the proper rites of humili humility? Um, I don't know, gratitude to Alexander. What's wrong with this guy? Naked, rough, bizarre. But then also there's something that's quite um, politically radical about this. He doesn't, he doesn't re respect, he doesn't recognise the authority of Alexander by telling him to get out of the way. He's making quite a powerful point. Maybe he's all human beings were equal. 
Now the phrase cosmopolites, citizens of the world, is said to originate with Diogenes. Diogenes, when he was asked, you know, where is he from? He gave that answer, I am a citizen of the world, cosmopolites. Now, of course, it's an interesting remark on many levels. But in Greek society, um, your identity is very much shaped and based around um, the city that you're from. You would be expected to do, um, you know, what we now call a form of national service, like military service in the city. Um, you were a citizen. So there's something that we might want to keep in mind about if Diogenes is saying he's a citizen of the world. He's kind of saying, my citizenship of Sinope doesn't really matter. Um, it's, it's something that I'm kind of rejecting <clears throat> because I'm saying that it's more important that I recognise my fellow humanity. Now, there are some things here that I'm going through which um, I'm not really defining. And if you're worrying about that, I will define them. I'm going to give you a bit of an outline into cynic philosophy in a moment, um, especially around one thing that was coming up is living in accordance with nature. This is very important um, to the cynics. I'll show you another image. This is from uh, John Waterhouse. And this is Diogenes in his barrel. <clears throat> you can see it kind of zoomed out there. Now, Diogenes is somebody who has these kind of interesting anecdotes that, in a way, speak his philosophy. No text of his or later cynic philosophers uh, like uh, Crates and Hipparchia, more on them in a moment, survives. So instead, the anecdotes kind of speak for themselves, living in a tub living without any clothes, living without any belongings, being odd, challenging other people's norms. This might remind you of enough prominent Greek thinker, and you would be right to make that link, but more on that in a second, I'm just making the screen bright. Um, I'll give you another anecdote. Um, one day, this is Diogenes, one day he saw a child drinking out of his hands. He hurled away the cup from his purse, saying, a little child has beaten me in simplicity of life. To live like a child, to live in simplicity of nature, to not be caught up in customs, to not be caught up in the vanity of human society and its artifice, to take instruction from a different master, nature. There's an interesting anecdote, and I think Nussbaum um, includes this in her account. Um, I think this is, well, she begins this book, chapter one, it's really the introduction, um, talking about Diogenes, and then he comes up again in chapter three, which is the chapter that I've asked you to read. Um, so, Diogenes, um, there's this encounter between Diogenes and Plato, and Diogenes is washing some lettuce, and Plato thinks, God, what an oik, washing lettuce in a market square near Gora. Is that all he's got to eat? This is a man who's clearly made some bad decisions in life. And so he says, and actually, and he refers here to um, a tyrant of Sicily who Plato did try and work for. Didn't work out well, I'll tell you why in a second. Plato says, if you'd paid court to Dionysus, you would not have been washing lettuce. Diogenes replies, if you'd washed lettuce, you would not have been paying court to Dionysus. It's just, I mean, on one level, it's just a funny account, isn't it? Um, that Plato is someone who's kind of you, he's the one who's gone wrong he's the one who's, who's kind of been humiliated um, by not recognising the good of frugality for good living, for human flourishing but there's another element to this as well what happened when Plato um, attempted to advise Dionysus, the tyrant of Sicily is that it didn't end well for him at all and he ended up being sold into slavery and ended up being able to escape but he ended up being sold into slavery so what does Nussbaum do with this account let's first of all look at this and then what we're going to do is start thinking critically about the way that she presents um, the cynic philosophy well Nussbaum first of all um, highlights a kind of a refusal that takes place and this refusal for her, it's quite significant because it's a challenge to something that she has also challenged earlier in her thought. I'm being a bit vague, so let me explain this. No spell. A Greek male refuses the invitation to define himself by lineage, city, social class, even free birth, even gender. He insists on defining himself in terms of a characteristic that he shares with all other human beings, male and female, Greek and non-Greek, slave and free. 
And by calling himself not simply a dweller in the world, but a citizen of the world, Diogenes suggests as well the possibility of a politics or a moral approach to politics that focuses on the humanity we share, rather than the marks of local origin, status, class, and gender that divide us. Great. Great, we'll be thinking. And certainly Nussbaum sees a lot of that um, salutariness. Um, I think it might be in Sex and Social Justice where Nussbaum highlights the, the all too powerful accident of birth and how that completely shapes the life that we might have. She does that a little bit here. She talks about, um, I think it's life expectancy in different countries. She's enough work she's talked about literacy. In Sex and Social Justice, she talks about the rates of female literacy in different places. So birth really drives everything, where you're born, what family you're born into, their social position, and then the opportunities that are available in your country so that certain minimal f capabilities can be cultivated. So Diogenes is on the right track. <clears throat> now, this all sounds good, but Nussbaum wants to draw, make a criticism of this tradition, and we're going to see it intimated here. Cynic, stoic, cosmopolitanism. Now, just before we move anywhere, that's an interesting conflation, isn't it? Because the cynics are a, a, a relatively small um, philosophical school, group, you know, grouping in ancient Greece. Of course, the Stoics originally are as well, under Zeno of Citium. Um, they meet at the Stoa Poikile. My Greek pronunciation is terrible. But... When we think of the Stoics, we tend to think of the Roman Stoics and of a tradition that is then um, reborn. I don't know, it takes on a new kind of life in Rome. It's kind of different. So even in cynicism and Stoicism aren't quite the same, but they conflate here. OK, so this form of cosmopolitanism urges us to recognize the equal and unconditional worth of all human beings. Great. Now, this bit is something that we're going to we're going to dig out. A worth grounded in moral choice capacity, or perhaps even this is too restrictive, maybe moral choice capacity is too restrictive a term, rather than on traits that depend on fortuitous natural or social arrangements. Okay. So Nussbaum is making a claim that what is defining this tradition is this view of human nature and human worth that is grounded on moral choice capacity. Choice capacity, that's interesting, about making choices, moral choices, to to, to do the better of two actions, um, to serve the common good in some way. Now, serving the common good is an important part of the Stoic tradition, certainly. not I wouldn't say it's part of the Cynic tradition, but is that still grounded as its highest principle in moral choice? I'm not sure, and that's something that we're going to dig out as we go along. Let me give you another line. Um, <clears throat> similar in this respect, but this is from chapter three. Uh, and this is where Nussbaum is trying to uh, dig into what makes the, st the, the cosmopolitan tradition distinct. Now, I said at the beginning of this lecture that she doesn't really define this tradition. And I stand by that. She gives this anecdote, Diogenes, you know, I'm from over, I'm a citizen of the world, but there isn't this kind of systematic set of um, definitions and then a kind of a bringing together of key ancient texts, you know, cynic, stoic, to then unpack and explain what a tradition is. That's not really there. Instead, bear in mind this book is based on a series of talks that are given. That's what gives it this kind of quite light, you know, kind of thrown together feel. Um, so Nussbaum is, is trying to define this tradition again. This is from page 69. She says, so what is this something? What, you know, what defines this tradition? What defines um, this underlying um, principle that is observed by human beings from this tradition? So she says, throughout the later cynic stoic tradition, again, it's complete, it is imagined as a set of capacities for practical reasoning and choice Capacities that all humans possess to a sufficient degree and that no non-human creature possesses to any appreciable degree. I'm showing you an image here of Diogenes in his barrel, of course, surrounded by dogs. Because I want to um, I want to challenge this remark. Um, it's going to come up on the next slide if you're kind of wanting to look over the words again. Um, that the cynic 
slash stoic tradition it emphasizes um moral choice i'm not sure about that and i don't think Nussbaum really does enough to demonstrate that but that, at this stage this is just her art okay um now you might have noticed in the quote you gave that she was using the word capacities a lot now just think for a moment what is a synonym for capacity yeah you probably have guessed it's that that's the c approach that Nussbaum has popularized and that she always comes back to especially now in her later books the capabilities so we'll actually we could oh, let me give you that quote again and we use the word capabilities throughout the later cynic stoic tradition it is imagined as a set of capabilities for practical reasoning and choice capabilities that all humans possess to possess to a sufficient degree blah 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 now where am i going with that why have i just changed the words around because I think there are parts in this book, and I haven't really noticed as much in her earlier works, where she really is inserting her own thought um, into the minds of ancient thinkers, and she is criticising them from a, a liberal 21st century perspective, which, at least, you know, speaking as a historian here, I think is unfair. Um, but it's something else. It's not just about this moral choice capacity, practical reasoning, blah, blah, blah. It's an argument that Nussbaum also makes. She says that the cynics and the stoics they are talking about an equality of of moral you know choice capacity worth which excludes non-human beings which excludes animals and one of the arguments that she wants to make later in this book is that the capabilities approach and the cosm it can i mean bring something new to the cosmopolitan tradition and it can help it deal with this you know tremendous oversight this tremendous arrogance in depriving non-humans of the same moral consideration. So that, that is an important argument in this book, which is kind of thrown in to chapter one, the introduction chapter. Now, this bit here is where I just want to say a little bit about cynical philosophy, because I think the cynics are very interesting, um, if we can put them into one school. And I want to think here about Diogenes, and this image here is Diogenes surrounded by dogs. Because I don't think, at least for cynic philosophy, that it's really fair to say that this excludes animals. I'll, I'll say what I mean in a sec. Okay, <laughs> now we zoom in. Um, right, um, so that was the quote that I gave you. Now um, let's go back to this story with Alexander. Um, when Diogenes introduces himself, and then he says, you know, get out of my light. He says, you know, who are you? You know, who am I? He introduced himself as Diogenes the Cynic, which is to say Diogenes the dog. Why? Why? Well, there's something about the Greek word cynic, cynic, cynikos, it means dog like. And then there's this kind of curious linkage among the cynics and their personalities with being like a dog. So a, uh, a cynic philosopher comes later, um, Antiphanes. Um, he was nicknamed Haplokuon, a simple dog. He met um, his kind of school um, was also near someone that had a kind of connection with dogs as well. But it's not just about that. It's not just about the name. There's something in which living with dogs, living, being a dog, living like a dog, um, has a bearing on what the cynics are striving to do. And I think the cynics make a really interesting, quite radical challenge to contemporary form, I mean, our form, um, in a way that I don't think even Nussbaum, you know, quite utilises, maybe because their philosophy can't really utilise this element of cynical philosophy. So let me just, let's just go through here what the cynics are about. So, the cynics are striving towards philosophy as a way of life. Um, the Greek word for this is askesis. It's a, philosophy is about a practice of living. It's not just about a way of thinking. It's not about purifying your thoughts. It's not about a meditation on epistemology. It's about how you live your life. Now we can see, and we can kind of feel, I expect, an influence here of Socrates. Socrates, the gadfly of Athens. Socrates nicknamed the stingray because he stings and he paralyzes and he produces a poria in his listeners, confusion. Socrates, who said that the unexamined life is not worth living. 
Now, there's, I see a lot of kind of crossovers there between Socrates and cynics. I'm going to give you enough examples of this in a second. So the cynics are striving for philosophy as a way of living, ascesis. But more than Socrates, even more than Socrates, they reject social conventions. The Greek word is nomos. They reject all forms of religious and political authority. The temples, the kings, the emperors. No. Their philosophy is, is about a rejection of this, but it's not about a complete withdrawal, is it? Because let's think about Diogenes here living in a tub in the public square. They are right in the middle of social life. They wear very few clothes, rags. Um, and they're striving, well, a philosophy that's a way of life, but it, it, one that holds nature as its standard of judgment, to live in accordance with nature. This is something that Spinoza much later will also advocate. Now, nature, as conceived by someone like Diogenes, is something that is about simplicity, frugality, it's about hardship, it's about toughness. But it's also about a lack of hypocrisy about our animal functions. And that was, this is where the dog-like element comes in. It's about bathing in public, urinating in public, and, and apparently masturbating in public. You do it all in public. Because human beings are too, conf uh, too preoccupied with artifice. They worship false gods. But nature has set the standard that we should follow. Let me give you a couple of quotes. Uh, this is from Diogenes Laertius, writing about Diogenes of Sinope. So Diogenes, observing a fool tuning a harp, are you not ashamed, he, Diogenes said, to give this wood concordant sounds while you fail to harmonise your soul with your life? So here is a man who's striving for for a way of life that is in accordance with his soul, that lives up to um, lives up to the possibilities of his soul, free of hypocrisy. Enough for anecdote. To one who protested, "I am unfit to study philosophy," Diogenes said, "Why then live if you do not care to live well?" So what's this about? Living well, living in, having a life that is in accordance with the development of your soul. That to me reminds me a lot of Socrates, reminds me a lot of somebody who defies social conventions and um, you know takes down the powerful, a peg or two sometimes in the dialogues in aiming to expose contradiction in our thinking. That's kind of what the Socratic method is about. He asks questions, um, not so he can impose his own beliefs, but so he can demonstrate contradictions in popular conceptions. So maybe there's something like this happening. But I might be kind of smoothing it a bit by relating it all to Socrates. I'm just going to make you aware of a book which um, has come out very, very, very recently, uh, Cynicism by Ansgar Allen. Um, I've read this book and it's brilliant, really, really good book. It's a really good introduction to uh, cynic philosophy then and now. Um, and what um, what Ansgar Allen does in this book is he emphasizes one of three ideals of cynicism, and that is frank, free speech. The Greek word is parisia. That the cynic challenges the powerful, is rude and coarse. He speaks truth to power, or she speaks truth to power. They're not doing that for the sake of, you know, mere rebellion or some kind of like stroppy um, egocentrism. This is because they are they are committed in their lives to a philosophy which is a way of living, which is striving for the truth. Now, alongside Parisia, freedom of speech, you have two other ideals. You have autarkia, self-sufficiency, and eleutheria, freedom, freedom of liberty. So living free of political and social conventions, living for yourself, speaking freely and frankly. Now, Diogenes is not amoral. He 
he is dissatisfied with the hypocrisy that he sees. So enough a quote, Diogenes, he would, would, he would rebuke men in general with regard to their prayers, declaring that they asked for things which seemed to them to be good, not for such as are truly good. So we have a true good versus an apparent good. We're going to get this with the Stoics later. That men are committed in their lives to pursuing wealth, honour, sensual pleasure, goods that completely you know, disrupt and preoccupy minds with catastrophic effects because there, are, there is a true and perfect and lasting good which is higher than that and that is the life of the mind. Okay, so be it. <clears throat> but if, if it's simply about that, why does Diogenes live in such an, you know, such an austere way, um, living in a barrel surrounded by dogs? Well, he says himself that he's trying to set an example. Even if the example is extreme, he's still trying to make a point. Apparently, he used to say, and this is again from Diogenes Laertius, uh, he used to say that he followed the example of the trainers of choruses. For they, for they too set the note a little high to ensure that the rest should hit the high note, hit the right note. So Diogenes is almost deliberately being kind of extreme, being like an exemplar, an example, so that others can follow. So that he can give an example of somebody who, who approaches a life that is in accordance with the soul, in accordance with the truth. So all of that is very interesting. And if we just kind of think here about the way that Nussbaum is using Diogenes and using cosmopolitanism, and then if we keep in in our own minds this cynic tradition, then I think there's something slightly different there. Especially this kind of aggressive defiance of political and social conventions, and in this frank and rude and bawdy and dog-like challenge to power and the powerful. I think there's something much milder in Nussbaum's use of cynic philosophy. And maybe we might think in our own times when we're surrounded by right-wing demagogues and very pressing um, concerns like the looming climate crisis. Maybe there's something in what Diogenes is doing, frank and rude speech. Or maybe not. I mean, do any of us want to live in a barrel surrounded by dogs? No, me neither. All right, let's get back to Nussbaum's argument. So Nussbaum wants to um, make a point that with this kind of rejection of worldly political authority is something else. The problem, as Nussbaum says, I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead, is that the cynics are throwing out, the Diogenes is throwing out something that we actually need to become moral agents to, you know, to kind of develop our souls. So we might remember that she makes this point that it's about moral choice capacity. Great. And that means that if we're going to kind of respect our equal dignity, as citizens of the world, we scoff at money, rank and power as unnecessary for human flourishing. That is, you take the view that human dignity, and notice that what's not added, the dignity of moral capacity, which is not present in Diogenes, the dignity of moral capacity is complete in itself. Therefore, you don't want any material help. When Alexander makes you an offer, you refuse it. You say, I am enough. This is enough. Nature is enough. The sun is enough. Great. Okay. But also says, okay, fine. But if all we're striving for is this kind of self-sufficiency, then we're not going to challenge any of the things that really ruin human life. These are just merely the goods of fortune. We reject material things. We live simply and frugally. But then that means we overlook how valuable material things are to a basic human life. Muslim says that philosophers such as Cicero, Seneca and Marcus, Aurelius, well-traveled and busily engaged in projects of imperial expansion, should not have neglected them, should not have neglected um, the, the the goods of fortune are material needs. Okay, here is Marcus Aurelius. Now, you might be thinking this is a slightly unfair criticism. I mean, well, on the one hand, Roman Stoic philosophy, although it's brought in through, you know, it's brought in 
but one of his earliest proponents is Epictetus, a freed slave. Its main later ad adherents are members of the Roman upper class. Perhaps we can understand why they would be, well, they would have more concern with rejecting the goods of fortune because they're surrounded with flatterers and temptations all the time. To kind of keep their minds, to not lose their wits, they make a disavowal and rejection of, of, of wealth and honour and sensual pleasure so that they can focus on their minds. That, okay, it kind of makes sense. But the deeper thing is, is this idea that these thinkers are lacking because they're not concerned about poverty. Now, poverty in the Christian tr tradition is a kind of ideal, but poverty is something that should be socially repugnant. It's very much a modern thing. You know, perhaps it appears from, during the time of the French Revolution, um, or maybe concerned with the large numbers of homeless people and beggars from the 16th, 17th century, although even back then, um, attitudes could often be quite hostile. I don't know if it, I don't like from a historical point of view, I don't find it fair um, to criticize past philosophers according to values and value systems that they didn't have. But Nussbaum does something quite interesting. So she, she go, if we go back to this, um, I know that this is a different version of Alexander and Diogenes. Um, <clears throat> Nussbaum asks, well, she says, why didn't Diogenes ask Alexander? I want you to give all your subjects a decent minimum living standard, including adequate nutrition and basic health care. Because, so the story goes, Alexander said, you know, I'll grant you any one wish. Diogenes could have asked for this. Everybody can have a basic living standard. I mean, it's an interesting thought experiment. What if he had done this? But I feel like this is a bit like, um, this is like traveling back in a time machine um, and leaving behind a digital watch or a mobile phone or something like this. A decent minimum living standard. The idea that human beings could have a universal living standard is just not, it's not present as, as something that people were thinking back, thinking about back then. No state could have provided anything like that. Basic healthcare, medical expertise, not many people have it. Um, adequate nutrition isn't necessarily a political decision at this point in time. There aren't always, you know, kind of stores that are kind of completely full of grain. It also depends on climate. Okay, you might think I'm making excuses here. But I do think that there's something that doesn't it doesn't quite sit right with me about trying to go back into this tradition and saying that it fails because it doesn't live up to certain 21st century liberal norms. That for me, I'm not sure. We can debate this. But Nussbaum then does draw up something that is quite useful here. So why is it that Diogenes doesn't, doesn't ask for this? Well, well, my answer is because why would he? He wouldn't even think of this. But Nussbaum says, well, he doesn't ask for this because he is striving for self-sufficiency. He doesn't want to have be in any form of need to someone else. This is part of wanting independence. Nussbaum. He would be saying, you have power over me. And he would be paying court to that power. Now, this might be reminiscent of something that we looked at with Rousseau. I think it was last week, a quote from Emile. Well, it was last week and it was the week before as well. Um, where Rousseau talks about human beings are shared in completeness. That is because we're needy that we love. It's because we're not self-sufficient that some of the greatest goods are for people um, can be present in our lives. Now, Nussbaum's philosophy, certainly in its kind of earlier stages, is all about recognising and getting us to recognise our vulnerability and our fragility so that we can um, embrace and appreciate the value of other people in enriching and adding to our lives without necessarily completing them either. And that's there. So her challenge is that Diogenes doesn't want to acknowledge his own human need. That's why he says, you know, get out of my get out of my way. I'm some baby. And that's okay. And if that were the argument, it would be a great and it'd be a very interesting argument. It's not I don't see it that argument as being very present there. So Nussbaum is trying to build this criticism that um that that the cynics refuse the goods of fortune. They refuse to contemplate the fact that we need 
stuff. <clears throat> and that this is a problem if we are interested in human rights and global human development, because these goods are what all of us need in order to live and live well. Like I say, I think this is an interesting argument. And I think this is, in, on some level, this is a great argument to make. The challenge that we need to think about is, is that what Diogenes is saying? Is that what the Stoic tradition is saying? Okay, and these are things that we could debate in our webinar um, on Monday. Um, before we leave Diogenes and talk about the Stoics, um, I thought you might find this interesting that um, Diogenes of Sinope has got um, a condition named after him. And it relates to hoarding. It's called Diogenes Syndrome. Um, and it is something that apparently um, uh, is more likely to affect people in older age. And it's where they neglect their homes and their physical appearance. Um, and they start hoarding lots and lots of stuff. Um, and they show no shame. That's why the doctors have given it this title. This is something of an article from 1975. They refuse offers of help and they show no shame about the fact that they all, and this, you'll see this uh, second sentence, all had dirty, untidy homes and a filthy personal appearance. So shamelessness. Of course, Nussbaum has some interesting things to say about shame. Now, Diogenes wasn't kind of dirty and filthy in this respect. And he wasn't a hoarder. And he didn't hide away from office. He's in the public square. He's um, in the middle of social life. So there's something different going on. But you might find that interesting. Okay, now, this guy on the left is Zeno of Citium, the founder of the Greek Stoic tradition. He's a very interesting figure. I think he, he, he briefly appears in this chapter. I think a work on the cosmopolitan tradition, if it were doing this systematically, would give this guy a much bigger place. So he, um, I think he's traveling by ship one day before he's pre-becoming pre a philosopher. And the ship's involved in a shipwreck, and he nearly survives. Well, he does survive, he nearly dies. Um, and then um, he suddenly becomes aware of, you know, that he wants to understand what really matters in life. And so he finds out about Socrates, and he wants to study Socrates' philosophy. So he goes into a bookshop, and he asks somebody, um, and the bookshop, well, the bookshop owner says to him, you know, you, should, you follow that guy, he should be your teacher. And the teacher is this guy on the left. It is Crates, I think that's how you say his name, um, who is a cynic philosopher who is married to Hipparchia on the right. Now, I'm just bringing this anecdote in passing because um, what's interesting is that in ancient Greek society, if this is to be believed, um, the cynics are seen as as much a successor to Socrates as, say, Plato and his academy, perhaps more so. Now, there's a great quote that does appear um, in Nussbaum where she's talking about the Stoic tradition and cosmopolitanism. And it refers to Zeno, who wrote a book called The Republic, same title as Plato, um, but advocates a quite a different society. It's one of complete gender equality. Um, and Plutarch says, the much admired Republic of Zeno is aimed at this one main point. This is cosmopolitanism. That we should not organize our daily lives around the city or the deem, the deme, I think, uh, divided from one another by local schemes of justice, but we should regard all human beings as our fellow deemsmen, demesmen, and fellow citizens. We should regard all human beings as our fellow citizens. And there should be one way of life and one order, just as a herd that feeds together shares a common nurturance and a common law. Zeno wrote this as a dream or image of a well-ordered philosophical community. Now that's also very interesting. So it's about the value of cosmopolitanism, um, but not only that. The idea is that cosmopolitanism isn't a kind of a political fact that you strive to achieve. Instead, it is an image. It is an idea that you work towards without ever reaching, like a kind of utopia. Kant would call these regulative ideals, ideas that kind of transform our conduct in aspiring to realise them without ever being able to fully realise them. Okay, let's move on to Marcus Aurelius, um, who makes up a big part 
of this chapter that we've been looking at. Um, a philosopher whose meditations, I think, are one of the most beautiful and accessible works of philosophy that is available. Now, Aurelius also presents himself as a cosmopolitan, as somebody who recognises that his citizenship isn't just with Rome, of which he is the Roman emperor, fighting on a series of military campaigns in what is now Germany, I think, but he's also a citizen of the world. So Marcus says, and I, this is quote in Nussbaum, if reason is common, so too is law. And if this is common, then we are fellow citizens. If this is so, we share in a kind of organised polity. And if that is so, the world is, as it were, a city-state. Now that is intriguing. If reason is common, so too is law. If we all have an equal capacity for reason, then we have a capacity to obey laws. If these laws are in accordance with reason, then what should restrict us from applying the same laws all across the world? We'll all be fellow citizens and we'll all live under one government, world government. Now, it's an amazing proposition, isn't it? And we get this idea of world government. It appears in Kant's work much later. Although Kant gives lots of reasons about why world government would be impossible to achieve. It's interesting to think about the status of an idea like world government in the 21st century. The nation state was kind of predicted to have gone to be in serial decline. And that, of course, has changed in the last few years. Perhaps it reflects the how the banks were bailed out by nation states and national banks. But it's also there in terms of right wing populism and the resurgence of nationalism. If we have the same reason, then we could have the same government. Of course, you might be thinking this itself is a dream of the philosophers. Reason, with a capital R, isn't that just a load of Eurocentric colonial shit? Well, I'm not sure. I've... There's a lot within the Enlightenment tradition, which is of great interest and of great political relevance, even if it is the um, work of a collection of philosophers from Western Europe at a time of massive imperial expansion. Anyway, let's get back to another era of empires and Marcus Aurelius. Another line, Marcus says, My city and my country, as I am Antoninus, Antoninus, is Rome. My city and my country is Rome. As I am a human being, it is the world. I put that one in front of you. <clears throat> so this is sometimes seen as the claim that we are from two families or two cities. The city of your birth, Rome, or wherever you're from. But then also that you are from the city of the world, uh, cosmopolites. Um, and that you kind of have like this double status. So there's a lot in what Marcus is saying, which fits into the cosmopolitan tradition. And it's interesting that he is a Roman emperor, um, you know, attacking and killing these Sarnations on military campaign. Now, if this were a work that was systematically unpacking the cosmopolitan tradition, then I would expect a long discussion of those parts. But what Nussbaum does instead in this book is she is trying to invite us to think critically about the limits of these philosophers in different ways. Now, a key part of our argument, and we've already criticised it, and we're going to add a little bit more criticism here, is that the Stoics, which I said is about the Cynics already, ground equality in the potentiality of moral reason. So we're going to look at that criticism in turn. We're going to challenge it a bit. And then the second criticism is that Marcus um, advocates a life that's really miserable. That when he makes these remarks, you know, the kind of like, that are quite... Um, I don't know, like alienated, you know, kind of have this kind of revulsion for the flesh, for the brevity of life. What he advocates in this place is on that is impoverished, it's barren, that's Nussbaum's term. So let's look at these in turn. We're going to look first at Nussbaum's argument that the Stoics um, are about this potentiality of moral reason, moral equality, we could say. But this, and this is our argument, this excludes the disabled. 
this excludes animals. We, so we need to think, are the Stoics actually doing this? So let's get there. So think about Marcus Aurelius. Does Is there a point in, point in meditations where he is looking at all human beings in terms of their capability, their capacity for moral reason? And on that count, I'm not really sure. I'm not persuaded that that's what he does. And Nussbaum doesn't persuade us because she doesn't really give that many examples from the text where he does this. You might be noticing that I'm being a little bit more critical than usual of Nussbaum's work compared to previous um, classes. And that's because I think there are some things, I guess, that I want to protect about the Stoic tradition that I'm very interested in. Um, and of course, I've got an agenda here because I want to teach a class on the Stoics um, quite soon. So I don't think the Stoics should be written off like this. But also, I think that sometimes the argumentation in this book isn't as strong as that has been in earlier works. So at least with Marcus's meditations, there isn't this claim. Instead, what you get in his work, if we're going to take away his kind of writing to himself, you know, trying to, trying to think critically and suspiciously about the passions, about flatterers, about keeping a clear head, he often um, talks about acting justly. And acting for the common good. Now I don't know. This maybe this doesn't stand, but my position is that because Marcus makes all of these great comments where he's talking about the good of others, the good of society, the common good, that this would mean that this was point that you know the, the disabled are being excluded from Marcus. And I don't think that stands in the meditations. I mean, what would it mean the disabled in in the Roman Emperor? Disabled people, if they were born with disabilities, would have been hidden from view, so Marcus wouldn't really have known about them. Um, and then people were far less likely to survive life-changing injuries like they are nowadays. So it is a slightly unfair standard. But uh, the thing is, I don't think it's quite borne out in the text. Let me just give you um, some quotes from Marcus, just to kind of substantiate this. Um, this first one is actually from Nussbaum, but it appears much later in the chapter. Um, well, I think he's basically saying something completely different. <clears throat> he says, Your only joy and your only rest is to pass from one action performed in the service of the human community to another action performed in the service of the human community. Elsewhere in the meditations, this is now a different translation, a uh, slightly older translation. He makes, this, again, a similar point. Um, about kind of not about excluding but acting for the common good so marcus remember that the term rational was intended to signify a discriminating attention to every every several thing and freedom from negligence okay in that formulation alone i know the translation is slightly archaic I don't see reason having this kind of exclusionary thing about it. It's more about a heightened awareness. Marcus continues. And that equanimity is the voluntary acceptance of things which are assigned to thee, to you by the common nature, accepting what is. And the magnanimity is the elevation of the intelligent part above the pleasurable or painful sensations of the flesh. And above that poor thing called fame and death and all such things. So mind and reasoning power and awareness of others is something that we prioritise over the pleasure and pains of the human body. I don't see that as excluding the disabled. If then thou maintainest thyself, you maintain yourself in the possession of these names without desiring to be called by these names by others, thou wilt be another person and wilt enter into another life. You might disagree, but for me, I don't. I think there's a really interesting point that could be made here about moral equality and how it possibly excluding the disabled. I think that's a great position to take. I don't think it's born up there. But let's get on to a second part. This you might have more sympathy for. And that's a claim that Marcus is advocating a really miserable, sad, you know, kind of you know, unpleasant life without the things we really value material objects but also our loved ones and 
Now this is, forms a bit of a bulk of this chapter. Let's just have a look at Nussbaum's argument and then we're going to contrast it with Marcus. Now Nussbaum first of all begins by taking out this argument that she's made against the cynics but it hasn't really been made systematically. Her point is that Marcus um, rejects the goods of fortune and therefore her implication is that he does not value um, things that we materially need for basic human flourishing. And interestingly, she includes the education. I don't think that's justified. I mean, I don't think that Marcus is, is see, I think he very much values education. I'm oh, sorry, I've obviously got a sore, sore point about this, but I think Marcus, I think the Stoics, they, um, there's more to them than what this account suggests. Nussbaum. If education is not external to virtue, but requ required for human flourishing, then the Stoics are just flatly inconsistent when they claim that we don't need anything beyond our power to flourish. Okay, but for this account to work, you need to tell us where they say that. Because there is a lot where they are encouraging suspicion and detachment, but I don't think that means we should remove education. Now, Nussbaum is on stronger ground when she talks about this anecdote, which I think has come up in her earlier works. Maybe it was in Upheavals of Four, um, where Marcus is talking about handling other people's irrational emotions as like being a child that is cons being like an, an adult that is consoling a child who has lost a toy. And this comes up here. So this one gives a, a, a longer account of this. So if there is a shortage of things indifferent, do not imagine that there is any great evil present for that is a bad habit. But still, as the old man in the play gave his child back the little top, fully mindful that it was just a top, you too behave in a similar way. Enough words. When you see people upset, be like a wise, paternal old man um, and respect and recognize that things matter to others but that they don't really matter this one summarizes this do not think yourself that the externals around which the drama of the moral life revolves are of deep and abiding significance the drama of moral life revolves i don't see well we could debate <laughs> we could debate lots um i'm not sure if that's at stake here um but recognize that most people do care about them very intensely, like little children who have not yet developed a sense of true value. Okay. Now, maybe that's not what Marx is doing, but maybe Nussbaum is still making a brilliant point that all of this kind of self denial, you know, lift, raising the mind above the body, this is, you know, going to take us away from what really matters love, family, children. This is what really concerns Nussbaum. You see on the third quote, this detached outlook would hardly prove sufficient to motivate energetic efforts of benevolence. Worse, maybe Marcus Aurelius doesn't really respect, he doesn't, he doesn't really respect what people value and care about because they're just fools. Because their child-like toy, grief, loss of liberty, doesn't matter. It matters to them, but it doesn't really matter. Nussbaum says that the Stoic attitude to externals bodes ill for the world of equal respect and reciprocity that they prize because, remarks like Marx's here, that are suspicious about people getting upset about trivial matters. Now, this point relies on a conflation. It works if Marcus is saying that grief and loss of liberty are like a child who's lost their toy. But he's not. He's not doing that. Instead, he's making a more sophisticated point about when people get upset. About, and maybe let's think about the work on anger here and want revenge and retribution over perceived slights, over losing material items that may, like you know, losing a, a watch or something that don't really matter. They don't matter in terms of what nature instructs for us to live well. To live in accordance with nature. And that's a cynic point, but you see that same influence there in the Stoics. Remember, the founder of the Stoics is taught by a cynic philosopher. Okay. 
So not spam is setting out to criticize shortcomings in Marcus Aurelius's thinking and probably what I've been doing here and what we can do when we talk is think, are these born out and does Marcus have an interesting reply? But there is a good exchange that comes up. Um, Nussbaum gives a long quote from Marcus and then she encourages us to think a little bit carefully um, about where this would leave us. And we're going to use this actually to um, think about some of the lasting problems and difficulties of cosmopolitanism. So I'm going to give you a long quote from Marcus. Um, and this in particular might be something that we could try and cover when we talk. Um, Marcus. Think all the time about how human beings of all sorts and from all walks of life and all peoples are dead. We must arrive at the same condition where so many clever orators have ended up, so many grave philosophers, Heraclitus, Pythagoras, Socrates, so many heroes of the old days, so many recent generals and tyrants. And besides these, Eudoxus, Hipparchus, Archimedes, other highly intelligent minds, Thinkers of large thoughts, hard workers, versatile in ability, daring people, even mockers of the perishable and transitory character of human life like Menippus. Think about all of those, but they are long since in the ground. And what of those whose very names are forgotten? So one thing is worth a lot, to live out one's life with truth and justice and with kindliness towards liars. And wrongdoers. This is a common thing. If you if you may you may have already read the meditations, if not, I highly, highly recommend this book to you, whatever translation, it doesn't really matter. Um Marcus frequently reminds himself of death um, and uses the kind of the challenge, the thought experiment of death, the reminder that as Isaiah says, all flesh is grass, um to hone in on what matters which is his mind reflecting reminding himself of the values of truth and justice and kindliness kindness to everybody even liars now it's a striking moment and let's think about how Nussbaum reads this she's going to make an interesting challenge she's going to say that well if we follow through on this we're going to be in a dangerous position Nussbaum because we shall die we must recognize that everything particular about us will eventually be wiped out. Family, city, sex, children, all will pass into oblivion. Okay, that's kind of there. But then it's the next bit. So we need to work out if we agree with the next bit. So really, giving up those attachments <coughs> is not such a big deal. What remain, the only things that remain, are truth and justice, the moral order of the world. In the face of the looming inevitability of our end, we should not mind being dead already. Only the true city should claim our allegiance. So there's something interesting going off there. There's quite a few bits. You've got a contrast of cities. Now, this has already been present. It was there um, in some of the remarks that we looked at earlier. That you can, well, it's in Marcus as well, that you can be a citizen of Rome and a citizen of the world. But Nussbaum is saying that the problem is that Marcus is prioritising the world and humanity over what really matters, well, not what also should really matter, which is, and let's put this charitably, our vulnerability. The fact that we need and we love others. Why should that be a source of weakness? Why should we want to disconnect ourselves from family city sex children what higher truth are we going to get to is that a truth that we're really going to want to live with maybe it's going to be very cold i think there's an interesting challenge there now nussbaum refers in passing to the circles of hierocles this is them in front of you our circles of concern we're concerned with ourselves, family, fellow citizens, fellow countrymen, and then the human race. Now, there's something, I guess, implied about that, which means that we can strive and aspire to be, to be cosmopolitan citizens of the world, but we don't neglect 
family. We don't neglect our fellow citizens. We prioritise both. We're not excluding them. And that's the tension, isn't it? If being cosmopolitan, if being a citizen of the world is to be a citizen of nowhere and is to not value these things. That's what Nussbaum was saying. That's what Theresa May was saying. But I don't think it really stands. Let me explore this point a little bit um, by going back to <clears throat> some Stoic philosophers. We had this pairing, a very, very good pairing, Epictetus and Seneca the Younger last week. Epictetus, the freed slave on the left, and Seneca the Younger on the right. Now what's interesting is that you can read these Stoic formulations in two ways. So Seneca says, what fortune does not give, she does not take away. Now, in this kind of um, aloofness about fortune, in Marcus's kind of aloofness about the body and the flesh, maybe they are disconnecting themselves from other human beings and from our familial and loving attachments. Maybe. Or maybe not. Maybe these are very practical words and reflections on rooting our sense of happiness and self and our values are things that we do have a greater degree of control over, even if ultimately in the end what we can gain control over is our own minds, or at least gain some control, not total control, I don't think any stoic would expect that to be realistic, but some control over our passions. To be aloof from fortune isn't to um, spit upon the goods of fortune. It's just to, to know that this is here for a time, and that is it. When Marcus is concerned and disconnects himself from his relationships with others, this is a man who 10 of his 14 children didn't survive to adulthood. If he seems dis a bit weirdly disconnected or alienated from these concerns, he's a man who suffered and lost an awful lot. Often with a lot of Stoic philosophers, although we shouldn't just read everything in terms of their biography, but with Marcus, and then even later, he's not quite a Stoic, but very much influenced by Stoic philosophy, Michel de Montaigne, the French essayist in the late 16th century. Both had chronic pain, chronic health conditions. So this kind of, this gloom is about holding on to, to life. Epictetus, you must remind yourself that you love a mortal and that nothing that you love is your very own. It is given you for the moment, not forever, nor inseparably, but like a fig or a bunch of grapes at the appointed season of the year. And if you long for it in winter, you are a fool. So too, if you long for your son or your friend when it is not given you to have him, knowing that you are longing for a sick in wintertime. It's a lovely passage, isn't it? You get the, well, Nussbaum talks about Cicero writing about his daughter, but Seneca also wrote about the love he had for his children as well. Epictetus here. He's not saying that we shouldn't love a mortal, far from it. He's saying we love, but we know that love cannot be permanent in, in the sense that everything is, we are mortal and things are changing, they're coming in and out of being. As Montaigne will say, everything has its season. Now, some of these concerns um, come from a, well, this one book in particular, which is great. Massimo Pigliucci, How to Be a Stoic. Um, he's written, I was kind of reading this great um, essay that he writes in response to Martha Nussbaum, um, but he's not responding to this book, um, The Cosmopolitan Tradition, but an earlier one. Um, he, he basically, well, he kind of um, he kind of sets out this challenge that we're setting out here, that maybe Nussbaum is being unfair to the Stoic tradition, also in this idea that Stoics want to renounce all emotions. They don't want to do that. John Sellers, Lessons in Stoicism. Um, if any of you do my Stoic course, which will be taking place, I don't know, sometime soon, um, we're going to look at these two books when we get started. 
Anyway, so Pigliucci says, and he's trying to summarize the Stoics. Well, I'll just summarize his position. He says that the Stoics aren't about removing ourselves from all emotions. It's about removing the influence of sad and painful emotions so that we can experience greater and more lasting joys. That's not about not feeling. That's about removing painful feelings. So, Pigliucci. For the Stoics, their training aimed at shifting our emotional spectrum away from unhealthy emotions like anger, fear and hatred, and toward mindful cultivation of healthy emotions like love, joy and a sense of justice. We've been picking this up already with Marcus, this interest in the common good, this interest in the welfare of other people, um, of being like a bee who acts for the good of the hive. Now this is useful, what's going to come up the Stoics. They even use distinct words for the two classes of emotions, pathé, pathology, painful emotions, and eupathéi, good emotions. So let's keep this in mind. Nussbaum is, is basically making quite a one-sided argument about the emotions. I think in order to then establish the relevance and the importance of what she's trying to do, which is um, reappraise the emotions are some of that are cognitive for human flourishing. So she sets up the Stoics as a kind of foil. They, they're good, they're useful, because they're, they also see the emotions as cognitive, but ultimately they want to stop us from feeling all emotions. But maybe that's not the case. Maybe there's more Nussbaum and Stoic philosophy have more in common than at first it would seem and that she presents. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It just means that maybe your position isn't quite as original. Okay. Now I want to go back to someone who doesn't really appear in the, this book that much. You might have guessed him earlier. It's Emmanuel Kant. Now some of you that were on a course that I ran, um, <clears throat> I think it was last year, um, the Anthropocene, um, where are we going? Um, we looked at Emmanuel Kant's essay toward perpetual peace. And this is where he sets out a cosmopolitan framework. Well, it's amazing. It's kind of also based around um, international relations. If we're not going to have a world government, then at least there are these kind of normative rules that states should abide by when they interact with each other. Now, Kant has this wonderful line. It's often um, it's interesting to keep in mind in terms of slavery. A violation of right on one place of the earth is felt in all. So there is this argument, and it is borne out by Immanuel Kant's earlier works in anthropology, that he is um, kind of scientifically for the time a racist, and that is present in these early texts. But later, in this perpetual peace, he makes this critique of slavery on these grounds. Now Kant, for his austere reputation, begins his essay with a joke. He talks about this, this Dutch pub sign. Um, about how basically human beings are kind of, you know, compelled to war, to the inevitability of war and death. And he says, you know, what if this were not possible? What if we could change things? And it's interesting to think about how the threat of war and the response to war and death is then what compels um, the idea of cosmopolitanism to return, perpetual peace as a way of escaping perennial war. Now, Nussbaum, as we've seen in this book, isn't sure about cosmopolitanism. And one of the arguments that she kind of develops, but it's not really quite there, and it was present, um, I think it was present last week, is this kind of emerging but never really well explained um, defence of nationalism and the value of the nation. The nation has normative value. The nation is something that can achieve concrete um, economic and social effects um, collectively for its inhabitants. So the nation and nationalism therefore has a kind of value. And so the problem, think about Theresa May here, the problem is that the cosmopolitan doesn't value the goods that could come with nationalism and nationhood. A few rare human beings may be able to have intense love and concern that is truly cosmopolitan and to live their lives with an awareness of the equal worth and equal needs of all. But once we let the passions back in, we will discover that they are not stably supportive of these ends. Maybe we could say that cosmopolitanism makes too big an ethical and psychological demands of people. We can't genuinely see, treat our fellow human as well as a fellow citizen. Our passions prevent it. 
But that's an interesting formulation, isn't it? Because Nuss Baum has kind of been doing this careful work over her career where the passions are not passions. The passions are not passive. The passions are emotions. Emotions that have a, that are cognitive, that reveal attitudes and dispositions. Emotions, therefore, that can experience a kind of transition that can be reprogrammed. So if we're going to let the passions back in, then we're going to kind of give in to the kind of negative emotions like anger, fear, shame, disgust, that Nussbaum in her other works has been trying to um, carefully release the influence of. This seems to kind of give in. But moreover, it still involves this conflation between um, that the cosmopolitan has no, gives no value at all to a fellow na na native. Maybe more than that, thinks that a fellow human being from another country, like a refugee, is deserving of more rights and more care than a fellow citizen. But that isn't proven, that's not demonstrated. She gives a quote from Aristotle. There are two things that make people love and care for something. This is Aristotle making a, a criticism of Plato's um, philosophical city, the philosopher kings, blah, blah, blah. There are two things, Aristotle's saying that this is how make, that explains why this isn't going to work. The thought that it is all theirs and the thought that it is the only one they have. Neither of these will be present in that city. People need and love and care for other things. Therefore, they can't hold on to this kind of abstract, you know, universal identity. It's just not going to work. Is that what the cosmos and demands? Let's just go back to this idea of war and responding to war. Eleanor Roosevelt, the UN Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 very Kantian document but one that is shaped indelibly by world war what by world wars by the failure of international diplomacy between the wars now this is about human rights it's not about national rights and these human rights are what we should all enjoy recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family This recognition is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. So maybe what I'm arguing for is a kind of defense of cosmopolitanism against what Nussbaum is trying to set out, because I don't think that the cosmopolitan renounces nationalism. Well, if they, it's not that they um, think that their the fellow national doesn't get isn't worthy of any rights, but that they want us to think on a more global on a more universal perspective. And I think as philosophers and as philosophy students, that's one that we should welcome. We can understand each other as fellow human beings and we can honor and we can care for people from different countries without that compromising our ethical commitments to, to our family or our loved ones or people around us. I'm sure in your own life you can think of examples of this. Moreover, I'm not. Sh I'm a bit wary of a, of a challenge to cosmopolitanism from a position of um, middle ground nationalism in a context like ours, in a context of emerging right wing populism, and in a context like this. I mean, it's a horrible image, isn't it, of, a, of an ongoing refugee crisis across the world that has affected Europe and will affect many other places, especially with the effects of climate change. What do we do? Do we pull up the drawbridge? In some ways, I think the call of cosmopolitanism is more relevant than ever because, as we're seeing with coronavirus, this is a virus that doesn't respect national boundaries. And that we would probably tackle it best if we work together collectively on a global level. Now, in our classes, previous classes, and this doesn't apply to all of you, um, we have looked at this in different ways. We looked at um, an essay by Onora O'Neill, Lifeboat Earth, challenging the idea from Garrett Hardin that when it comes to international development, there are rich countries, the people in the boat, and there are poor countries, the swimmers who want to get in the boat. But the boat only has enough space, enough life jackets, enough drinking water for a certain amount of people. Therefore, ultimately, the swimmers must drown. Onora O'Neill makes a brilliant argument against this. 
But when we think about these ideas, they do seem like they themselves are off a different era. Like the Buckminster Fuller, the kind of late 60s, early 70s, cosmopolitanism of a world in which dreaming was more viable. Maybe a world different to ours. When we think about these frightening levels of um, refugees in the next few years, one thing that we mustn't do is think that we somehow ha um, have more have more rights than they. That we are comfortable and safe, whereas they are not, and that is how it should be. We ourselves, we could become refugees just as easily through floods, through different forms of upheaval, through political collapse. And then, wouldn't then we want and hope for and expect hospitality from other countries? Well, if we want such hospitality, we'll need to kind of champion and champion to others, friends and family, the values of cosmopolitanism, of, of looking at human beings from a universal perspective, not just prioritising the nation state. Because we need global solutions to some of these problems. Okay, so those are some challenges, some limitations with the cosmopolitan tradition. Let's just say, a I'll just say a couple of bits finally about this, and then we're going to start rounding up in this course. Um, <clears throat> so the book ends. The gates of the cosmic city must open to war. So there is this kind of call at the end for cosmopolitanism but what she has set out earlier is that there needs to be overlapping doctrines that we shouldn't just say that liberal universalism you know cosmopolitanism we're all citizens of the world fuck the nation state she's not saying that this is best she's saying that we need to kind of allow and respect religious forms of identity national forms of identity you might have noticed this um that she makes these um minor but quite interesting criticisms of trying to impose international law on other countries. We had this whole debate came up with Brexit and, the, and um, the power of Brussels, that the nation state must be sovereign. She calls for material aid, but doesn't really say how. Cosmopolitan tradition isn't really defined in this book. And if you were to look at the references, well, most of them are to other Nussbaum books. So this isn't really... Um, this book doesn't really stand with the same weight as, say, the fragility of goodness or therapy of the therapy of desire or upheavals of thought. It's based on a series of talks. It's presenting an interesting argument. Um, but I don't want I don't want us to remember Nussbaum on this. I want us to remember on the earlier books. Now, we, let's just put into contrast here um, before we kind of end with on this book. We have what this, the kind of, politics of this book more broadly is it's basic assumptions and we get this actually in a lot of Nussbaum's thought that she's dealing with the normative she's dealing with things as they should be and she is dealing with a view of politics which tends towards human flourishing we could say it's eudaimonistic but that this view might be slightly out of kilter um, with politics and international relations as it plays out now, I think it's a view that holds a lot to Cicero. Cicero does, um, he is the subject of chapter two of this book, which is from Of the Republic. And he basically, his argument here, well, you can read the quote yourself, um, is that there is this kind of inherent law, and this natural law this, that tends, to, that in politics, that tends towards peace and virtuous rule. That rulers are naturally bound and naturally aspire to duty, to the good, Now, I don't know if you know, can guess who the figure is on the right, who looks very, very devious. He is an Italian political philosopher and historian. It's Niccolo Machiavelli. And Machiavelli and the prince says something quite different. Whoever sets a republic in order and establishes its laws must necessarily assume that all men are evil. And that they must always make use of the malice in their soul whenever opportunity gives them free reign. Okay. So the Machiavellian, the Spinoza, and the Hobbesian view of politics, this book isn't. And nor, I mean, it would be very interesting if, if Nussbaum were to really wrestle with 
the what something's called the realist approach to politics. You get it in the Roman historian Tacitus as well. The Spinoza, Spinoza says dealing with human beings not as they are, but as we would like them to be. That's the limitation of the normative approach of Cicero and not about. Anyway. So you might remember the anecdote that this image refers to. It's the story of Thales, or in Aesop's fables, it's just, you know, the philosopher uh, who falls down a well or a hole in the ground one day when he's walking and looking up at the stars. He doesn't see what's in front of him. And we use this image at the very beginning of the course to think about this kind of subtle and very interesting challenge that Nussbaum is offering to the history of philosophy and to philosophy more broadly. But yes, metaphysics um, is fascinating. Yes, understanding the constitution of the human mind is very useful, but we're at risk if we overlook the things that really affect us. Society, our loved ones, our relationships with others. Her philosophy is concerned not with looking within, but very much of thinking about what's outside us, our relationships with others, our interdependence, our reciprocity. Now, this comes up quite wonderfully in a letter to her younger self that we also looked at much earlier in this course. We cultivate our inner world. That is important. But this cultivation doesn't just occur through, um, well, it's quite a stoic point, isn't it, with status and whatever, but um, nor does it necessarily, um, nor is it necessarily cultivated by um, renouncing status, no matter Diogenes does. Instead, we cultivate our inner world by recognising our reliance on us, our dependence on us. That quote, we all begin our lives as helpless babies, dependent on others for comfort, food and survival itself. And even though we develop a degree of mastery and independence, we always remain alarmingly weak and incomplete. Now, this shared incompleteness is a wonderful line that we see in the monarchy of fear. We see it in the way that uh, Nussbaum comes back to Rousseau's a meal time and again shared incompleteness dependency now these are sometimes seen as bad things as unpleasant things as our weakness but maybe it's what makes us strong maybe it's what makes human life beautiful it involves a degree of vulnerability it involves a lot of care but through that care the most beautiful things blossom to be like a vine and the fragility of goodness begins to recognize that in the vine, in the plant, is love and care and energy and generosity and goodwill. It's a life that is rich, a life that is not immured from the adversities of fate, but it in some way accepts them. We could be like gems. We could be self-sufficient completely and not rely in any way on other human beings. But then, as Rousseau said, that would be like being a king of some sort. If we were like that, we wouldn't love. Well, we wouldn't be vulnerable, so we wouldn't be vulnerable to heartbreak, but we wouldn't love. What would we have? We'd have ourselves. For Nussbaum, her running point is that that is a very poor life. Now, at the beginning of this course, we also looked at three features of Nussbaum's philosophy, and I think these three features are actually borne out quite well, actually. I think they're good ways to kind of explain it. A lot of the things that we have been tackling in the books. The first is that philosophy, almost like Diogenes, is an ascesis. It is a way of life. And that the way of life should be one that is therapeutic. That philosophy isn't just about trying to um, explain and categorize the content of our minds, but it's about a kind of rich form of development, one that intensifies the pleasures of human experience. Now this point appears in the therapy of desire where Nussbaum is saying, well, you know, some people don't look at Hellenistic thought, Stoics, Epicureans, because of the literary way 
But actually, in this way, it's really useful. There's a great line just in the middle. That you can get the good things you are searching for, flourishing calm, only for a lifelong commitment to the pursuit of argument. Thinking critically and arguing. Now that's present in the therapy of desire, but I think it's not just about argument or thinking critically. We could think of this in a slightly different way. Not as a kind of pedantic, kind of um, insistent attention to the shortcomings of someone else's stated views, but a way of critically investigating and analysing what really matters for us and other people in our lives. And what that means is that we don't view the emotions, just as we don't view our relationships on offers, as some kind of baggage, as some kind of um, external shell that we need to get rid of. We need to embrace these emotions. They are not barnacles, as Plato says, slowing us down. Instead, they are intelligent responses to important concerns. They move us, the emotions, they move out. They're part and parcel of the system of ethical reasoning. And that means that the good philosopher has to kind of confront her or his anger or fear, shame and disgust and work out cognitively what they mean. Above all, the third thing is that our thinking begins by recognising our dependence on offers. That was there in that letter to herself. Our dependence, our vulnerability, our fragility, which gives us love and friendship. We can't be immune to fate. We can't be immune to the ravages of luck. We need other people and we love other people. And that is always going to enrich our lives. Now, the thing here, I haven't really, I mean, a lot of her works are of very political nature, and I haven't really flagged, I've not really made a big deal about this towards the end, but you can see that just at the end of this long remarks from The Therapy of Desire, um, which is probably probably my favourite book by Nussbaum. But the task of government is to give people the social conditions of a life worthy of human dignity. That when we recognise our dependence on others, when we recognise um, our fragility, this has got to take us to a political point in which we start demanding um, international and national justice and advocating political campaigns that are going to protect offers and that are going to strengthen us rather than weaken us. But Nussbaum, from her very earliest career, is an Aristotelian philosopher. A philosopher with tremendous uh, facility uh, in ancient Greek texts. That's partly why she's able to use like these ancient Greek literary works and, it, and read them as philosophical texts in such a brilliant way. You get that in the fragility of goodness. And as an Aristotelian influence philosopher, she's concerned with eudaimonia, with flourishing, with living a good life, or as she says in this great interview with Bill Moyers, a livable life. A life that is rich and full, that involves many different activities. The ability to love and care for a family, the ability to get an education, the ability to think well, the ability to be a moral person and to choose well. But again, we notice even here at this early point in our career, it, all of these require recognising our, our social position and society and political structures. It's interesting, Nussbaum, for our career, kind of holds back from being very critical of these socio-economic structures, but she's very aware of them. That they are like the gardener. The gardener who cultivates the vine, the plant, always in need of support from society, from others. Okay, um, <clears throat> so let's start wrapping it up. At the end of this course, quite a long lecture. Um, some questions that I would like us to debate, um, these kind of bear more on the text. What place does cosmopolitanism have in 21st century society? This is something that we, I explored a bit already at the beginning. In what ways should we recognise and respond to our deepest fears and vulnerability? This is a broader Nussbaum question, I think. Oops, let me get this up. Um, and what, for you, has been the most striking thing about Nussbaum's thought? The thing that you're going to remember most? The thing that you found most insightful and most interesting? And most frustrating? 
a particular book, a particular reading that, that has stood out to you that you have since read more of, or whatever? What has been my strike the most helpful? Okay, so this is it. Um, thanks very much. This is the last, well, it's the last lecture, but I'll be talking to you um, live tomorrow, and then we'll have off a W discussion forum as well. Um, thank you very much. Um, I've really, really enjoyed this course. Um, I think this is, I think this is the first time that Martha Nussbaum's philosophy has been taught systematically on a, co on a course like this, anyway. Um, and so it's been very interesting to work through a living philosopher. We're going to talk on Monday. There's a forum. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure what's going to happen with next term's teaching because of teaching remotely. Um, but I am 95% sure I'm going to teach you guys something. And I think I'm going to teach the Stoics. You've probably been able to tell I've already been doing research on this because it's come up. I'm defending the Stoics. Um, if you would be interested in taking part in this course, please could you send me a short email so that I can just make sure there's enough interest because it's going to be a lot of work for me to write a course um, and I want to teach the Stoics in quite an unconventional way. Um, so if you'd be interested in getting these kind of like weekly lectures and having a discussion, then please email me. Um, that's my email address. Okay. All right. Thanks very much, everyone. And I'll speak to you all tomorrow.